Wage Day, so uh, you get Charlotte and I this morning. Yeah. <laughs> I think the two of us are a little nervous, so please bear with us. Uh, are there any announcements? Yeah. <laughs> You've probably heard me announce this a number of times. I'm Charlotte Watson, and I'm one of the coordinators for the Curtis fundraiser. Uh, the deadline is November the 26th. You can go online and order yourself, or you can come and see me, and I can place the order for you. Um, just for your information, total sales to date is 2000 228.50, which is a profit for us of 584.98. Oh, good for you. Make 
posters. Okay, so she helped me make this poster. Well, she made the poster and I produced it, but long ago. UCW group in our region and some Mennonite people put together a performance in Calvary a few years ago. Once in a while it comes back to Center for it's always now an after school group or like an extracurricular activity because there are so many people who don't want the show to just go into history. It's um in my view it's a one of those gems of reconciliation stories goes quickly, goes through the sorrow, hurt, and comes out with a hope and a future looking uh, positivity. There's not a lot of talking, it's mostly dance music, and some of a speaking poem, Chief Judge George's words sometimes. And I just highly recommend it. If you've seen it, you might go again, as some of us do. And if you haven't, please try to come. It's a week from tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, so it should be done by 9. It's in the high school theater, which is such a comfy place to be. And hopefully we can hear everybody, Jeff. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very well done for that age group. And uh, anyway, tell other people, too. Tell other people. It's from Strathmore, it's from Sick Thicka. It's local. Okay. Um, the Denelda already mentioned the Art Sunday 17 concert on December 1st, but the Vault is also doing an event here on December the 8th called the Christmas Star. Roland Duchesne is an astronomer who lives just south of the river, somewhere around uh, Carsland area. Um, and um, he has um, been doing this presentation for a number of years um, and requested to do it in a church. So he's going to talk about the Christmas star from an ast astronomical um, standpoint um, and um, leave the question of, was it a Christmas miracle? Um, we're sharing the information out to all the churches, and uh, it's a family event, as is the Buzzbrass concert on December 1st. So if you would like to invite your friends to come on December 1st or December 8th for Christmas events, that would be awesome. And <coughs> the Christmas star is free. Well, some of you haven't seen this vintage mission and service hat for a long time. But you know, Laura and I went to Kananaskis to a stewardship event, and I'll bet it's 25 years ago, Laura. And the delegation that came from Nova Scotia made these MS hats in the MS color and sold them as part of their fundraising for MS. And way back then was when we just started the Minutes for Mission. I know it was way back when John Snyder was here, and we've had Minutes for Mission ever since. And um, everybody in the congregation did such a great job of beat the budget that sometimes we forget that one of the budget items we have is the Mission and Service Fund. And each year we set a goal, and it's stayed just about the same for many years now, of uh, sending $18,000 uh, to m and And those of you that have your weekly envelopes and who very faithfully give your um, m and donation, you remember that it goes directly to the National Church for m and uh, We don't touch it at all here in the congregation, so any money allocated for m and goes directly for that. Those of you who want to know where your m and money goes, these annual reports are out on the table, and for your reading, uh, have a look at them. Uh, bring it back and leave it there for the next person, because if you really want to know, besides our minute for mission, what we're doing, this is where the money goes. It's also that time of the year for the gifts with vision, and there's all these catalogs out there too, and as much as we all hate to say that Christmas is on the doorstep, it really, really is. Uh, step away and take one of these, please, and peruse the kind of gifts that you might give to help somebody else mm -hmm. and not give a gift to one of us who does not need one more thing. So please note that these are out there. And uh, I have run this through council, so it's a council project. After we finish Beat the Budget, we're going to see if we can meet the budget for MNX. We're lagging behind someone, and we only have, I think it's seven weeks or nine weeks 
left before the end of the year. So way back when, when I used to wear this cabbage or enthusiast, I had that we can do it by filling these canisters. They're vintage now, you don't see filled canisters anymore. I've never allowed them to be thrown out of the, out of the fellowship room there. But um, I was hoping that people would take it home, and lots of people tell me they don't like the loose change. Put your loonies and toonies in these. These will hold up to 25 loonies and toonies. And uh, one of those a day is probably going to hurt too many of us. And between now and the end of the year, if you want to contribute uh, your change, you can do that. If not, we have brand new M&S envelopes that if you want to put a year-end check or something in, please avail yourself of uh, these envelopes as well. Um, you know, we do have to beat the budget in more ways than one, and M&S is very important. So I'm going to be bringing this to everyone's attention every week, and I've got some canisters at the back, and the envelopes will be there too, and please feel free to use them. That was quite a few. <laughs> I think we're busy people. Okay, let's us prepare for our service. Just as butterflies leave behind their chrys chrysalis, baby birds break out of their shells and snakes shed their skin. We too discard our parts, old parts of our lives, in order to keep growing. We go through changes in work, in family structures, in friendships, in our own beliefs and values, and all throughout our lives. When we give ourselves permission to say yes to new experiences and ways of being, that often means letting go of old habits and patterns, a kind of decluttering the mind, body, and spirit. Today in worship, we will honor what it means to release what is no longer necessary so that we may make room for positive changes. And now we are blessed with a beautiful choir this morning.
behind the pulpit, and then nobody will see your knees more. <laughs> but in order to the, do the children's story, I have to be out here. So welcome. Let's keep celebrating the season of growing, becoming, and emerging. And we'll start with the call and response. Loving God, we thank you for your true self that deep within us sings. So if we had children, but we don't. So for tender hearts that hold us, for love that gives us wings, we praise you for emerging hope that all around us springs. For tender hands that hold us, for love that gives us wings. It's been fun uh, with um, Chris, the blanket that Pamela has been using, but she didn't leave it behind. So now you have to use your imagination. Um, it's been fun taking out this blanket and seeing it not just for what it is, but for what it can be. Today we are transforming the blanket into a, a stage. So I'm laying the blanket on the floor, and I really like Chris, so I make sure that I have to take my shoes off so I'm not getting my dirty feet on the blanket. Um, so for the next part, I'm going to talk about how nervous and self-conscious I get when I dance in front of people. Something definitely outside my comfort zone. It's my example, uh, but make something your own. What's outside your comfort zone? Singing, public speaking, reciting something from memory such as a poem or your lines in a play. Um, and so, leading the children's message, so this is for the young and young at heart. A stage is an exciting place where stories are told, where songs are shared. It can be a moving experience for the audience and rewarding for the performers. But just about every performer has times when they get at least a little bit nervous. And a little bit of nervousness was okay. That's what I heard. <laughs> it's a sign that we really care about what we're doing and what we want to do with it as well as we can. But when those nervous people start even taking the stage in the first place, God wants us to spend our lives spreading our wings, not waiting in the wings. Um, and the gal that's written this, she says she's okay with some sing on things on stage like singing. And she doesn't get too nervous uh, public speaking. But when it comes to dancing, she's saying, my whole body freezes, and I feel like my feet are stuck in cement. I feel awkward, uncoordinated, and, and like a second everyone sees me dancing, they're all going to laugh. And so I get very shy about dancing at all, on stage or not. The sad thing is I really enjoy dancing. I want to dance. Maybe I can leave behind my fears and for a few seconds anyway, if I had some friends that could join me. And I'm going to ask Laura to come up because my favorite dance without question is the chicken dance. <laughs> so if anybody remembers the chicken dance, you go like this. Okay, we're going to try it, so everybody stand up. Thank you. 
Christian dance, music start, it gets me on my feet. Got it? Okay. That was wonderful and fun and worth the risk. It helped knowing you were there supporting me. And if we all support each other more, maybe that will give us the courage to take a step forward, to take the stage, to take a chance. When you go home today, transform your blanket into a stage. Imagine something God has given you the heart to do. Then take the stage, trusting that God is there for you, rooting for you to move forward. Let us close with a Christmas prayer. As you look to your Christmas, echo me, loving God. Help us to leave behind. All the worries we don't need, all the worries we don't need, so that we can dance, so that we can dance, and sing, and sing, and move forward with you, and move forward with you. And before we say Amen, lean in close to your chrysalis and whisper the word forward. Amen. So I would like to announce the choir gonna, is going to sing Let Us Pray for Peace by Thomas Kiesecker.
begins to sense the calling to new heights. Expansion of wings, however, means that some things were found that can that ever go back into the cocoon. Not even if it wanted to. And so it is time to leave it behind. The Israelites that left Egypt were aching for freedom, and yet when faced with the disorientation of all that was new and familiar, many began crying to go back. They found the past requires deep trust in the God who has promised to be with us always. And from Exodus 16. A whole congregation of Israelites set out from Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month, after we had departed from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to show us for us and we hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven to you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what, for what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared from the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord of your God. In the evening, oils came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as the frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? But they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, and more per person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. This is what said, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing more, and those who gathered little, little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until morning, and it became wormy and rotten. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it as much as each needed, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much food, two owners of when all the leaders of the congregation came and told them, Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake, and boil what you want to boil, and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until morning, just as Moses commanded them, and it did not rot, and there were no maggots in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today we you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall find it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to death, and they found none. The Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? See, the Lord has given me the Sabbath, therefore on the sixth day he gives you food. 
Each of you stay where you are. Do not leave your place on the So the people rested on the seventh day. The Israelites called it manna. It was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an owner of it be kept throughout your generations in order that they may see the food with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar, and put an omer man in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. Just as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the covenant for safekeeping. Just as the Israelites ate man forty years until they came to the habitable land. They ate man until they came to the border of the land. Now we'll sing uh, in Voices United, number 556. Would you bless our homes and plan families?
God is loving and patiently caring for the people as they learn who God is and what God has in store for them. No sooner do the Israelites leave Egypt under the most miraculous of circumstances that they lapse into an old pattern. They again use their own perception of, our, of their circumstances as the standard by which to base reality. They have not learned that even though they are in the desert with no food or water, God is above their circumstance. So they grumble, not once, but three times. Today's story of their grumbling about the lack of food is sandwiched between two stories about their grumbling about the lack of water. God uses these occasions not to punish them, but to teach something about himself. Throughout these stories, we see echoes of Egypt and the plagues to remind them of what has happened. But the passages also give glimpses of what is to come. It has been three days since the Israelites have crossed the sea. For three days, they have been traveling through the desert no water in sight. The harsh realities of a desert march begin to set in, and they fear they may die of thirst. Again, the grumbling against Moses begins. What are we to drink? <coughs> Moses responds in a manner familiar to us. He cries out. The same way the Israelites cried out to God, begging for relief from their oppression in Egypt. God responds in a manner, reminiscence of the plagues and the exodus. God performs another water miracle. The people came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. They set up camp there by the water. What a welcome sight that must have been a foretaste of the promised land. With the flow of 12 springs, everyone had plenty of refreshing water to drink. On the 15th day of the second month, after they had left Egypt, we are now roughly 45 days since they crossed the sea. The entire company moved on from Elam to the wilderness of Sin. The whole company again complained against Moses and Aaron. Why didn't God let us die in comfort in Egypt, where we had lamb stew and all the bread we could eat? You have brought us out into this desert to starve to death, the whole company of Israel. Already, yet again, they have forgotten God's provision in bringing them out of Egypt and supply of water in the desert, an abundance of desert, of water, not one spring, but twelve. For some things, memories are short. How does God respond to this realm of complaints? God rains down bread from heaven, manna that tastes like honey, a foretaste of preparing for when they enter the promised land, the land of milk and honey. God's grace raining bread from heaven, with no hint of anger or malice. God provides for the people again. God's gift to the people. They are to gather only enough manna for one day. <clears throat> this gracious provision of food is not to be hoarded, but God is to be trusted anew every day. We are told it is a test to see they will honor God God's instructions, and also a measure to help develop trust. Israel is to keep in a perpetual state of dependence, trusting that each day God will provide. Only on the sixth day are they to gather enough for two days. On the seventh day, the Sabbath, they are not to gather food. Note the nature of the Sabbath command. It is not simply that the Sabbath is observed by the Israelites. They are to refrain from gathering food. Rather, it is God who refrains from supplying the food. 
It is God who ceases working. God is resting. So that no man or quail will be found. Some of the Israelites break the command, not by actually gathering food, but merely by attempting to do so. Keeping the Sabbath is something God does and the Israelites are expected to follow suit. This pattern is rooted in creation itself. The Israelites rest because God did. This act of disobedience, looking for manna and quail on the Sabbath, is met with a stunning rebuke by God. How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? This pattern becomes commonplace throughout the track in the desert. Rebellion in the face of God's clear commands. The people were obedient to Pharaoh. God battled Pharaoh and won the people. And now they must be obedient to God, a God who protects and provides. The gifts of manna and quail and water, provision that keep them fed and watered, but also are a lesson about God. God wants the Israelites to know him. In other words, to honor, respect, obey, trust. God is teaching his people who God is, and the lessons have only just begun. It is in this context that Moses addresses the grumbling of the Israelites. They have complained to Moses and Aaron. But their real complaint is against God. It is God who they are not trusting, and even mocking by the display of thanklessness. God responds by giving the people an, another glimpse of his exodus at night. There, out in the desert, they see the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The last time the Lord appeared as a cloud was as the people were making their way through the sea. The cloud was then a sign of God's presence with and protection of his people, just as it is now. This cloud is a glimpse of what is to come. The book of Exodus ends with the cloud covering the tent of meeting and God's glory filling the tabernacle. God's people in the desert. The desert is a difficult time for the Israelites. It is easy to condemn them as faithless. But I suspect, suspect that many of us would not have fared much better. Life was hard in Egypt, but it must have seemed even harder still in the uncharted desert through which they are traveling. In Egypt, there was routine. They knew what the day would bring, not so in the desert. There, things were always changing. Their only recourse in the barren land was to trust God completely, total trust and obedience. The Christian's desert wanderings. The desert period of the Exodus community is ours as well. As a faith community and as individuals, all have experienced the desert. How do we trust in God's provision? How do we avoid rebellion? How do we let go of the past? We tend to paint the past with rose-tinted glasses. How do we let go and leave behind what needs to be left behind? And embrace the present and move forward into the future. The Israelites had to leave Egypt, Egypt not only really physically, but emotionally too. They had to quit thinking of Egypt as a place of comfort. They had to leave it behind and trust in God's provision for the present and in God's promises for the future. If they remember God's generous gift, God's generous gift of 12 springs of fresh water surrounded by 70 palm trees and gave thanks, they may have trusted that God would provide in the present. If we remember God's generous gifts, Jesus, the bread of life, the one that feed, who feeds and satisfies both body and spirit, 
and trust in God's steadfast love and care. We will be better prepared to recognize God's provision to see us through the desert and accompany us into the land of promise. Life is all about change. Leave the confines of the chrysalis behind. Move into the future, unknown as it is, trusting in God's generous provisions. Amen. Amen. And now we are singing uh, Voices United 376, Spirit of the Living God. Together our prayers, those spoken and those held deep within our hearts, and be with us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
and is generous to all beyond measure. So we, God's people, are to care for all with generously, generosity and gladness. We bring our offerings to be used for God's purposes in the church and in the world.
this with me. I think we both can unlock our knees now. <laughs> the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And now let's share Christ.